2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And the King James text today reads, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Amen. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. I'm going to talk to us today on the topic zero sum theology. Let's go to the Lord one more time. Master, once again, Lord, we bow our heads before you. We humble ourselves in your presence as a mere mortal man called of God to do a work that is beyond me. I come before you, Lord, seeking the anointing, the Holy Ghost touch that allows my mouth to work, my mind to work, my spirit to work in unison with your great Holy Ghost. Lord, that you might use me today as your oracle, your mouthpiece, to deliver a prophetic word to the church of the living God. To declare, thus saith the Lord. Lord, not merely to present the ideologies, the theologies, the thoughts of men, but rather, O oh God, the divine thoughts of God. Help us to understand the spiritual principles which I'm about to set forth today. For we understand, O oh God, that they which are in the flesh cannot please you. For spiritually things are spiritually discerned. Help us by the Holy Ghost, every viewer, every listener, both live and by recording, help us, O oh Master, today to listen and see and hear with our spiritual man and not just our natural man. And let the Holy Ghost from heaven quicken that spirit within us that we might not merely hear, but we might receive with gladness the engrafted Word of God. Nor the speaker and the hearer, we ask it today and none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. I have a lot of territory to cover today, so I'm going to have to stay close to the pulpit. If I don't, I will likely run well over time, and I try not to do that. The modern day Church of Jesus Christ has devolved. It has devolved in the same manner as its older sister Israel had devolved in the Lord's day. It has become a religious structure without mercy and a message of heaven being beyond hope. It's far easier to control the masses and stir up their ire as well as to get them to fill your offering plates. 
If you preach a message based on fear and condemnation, it's a lot easier if you preach a fear and condemnation message. Not only to get people in the pew, but to get people to give. I, I have seen a number of people who at one time or another were part of the evangelical uh, culture war propaganda machine and part of that movement. Some of them have become enlightened and have come to an understanding, uh, a godly understanding of things. And they've stepped away from that thinking and they've stepped away from that movement. And it's interesting because I've seen a number of them talk about the fact that when preachers began to preach the anti-abortion message and when preachers began to preach the anti-gay message, Oh, they could get people's emotion worked up. They could really get people emotionally invested. And when you get people emotionally invested, they said all of a sudden the giving went up and up and up. All of a sudden they're offering plates. All of a sudden these TV preachers found that people were given a whole lot more money. If they were seen as being on the front lines of the culture war, if they were seen as being on the front lines of the abortion battle, if they were seen as being on the front lines of the anti-gay movement or the anti-transgender movement, all of a sudden people would give a whole lot more. And therefore the, the, the tail began to wag the dog. In other words, the preachers began to preach that garbage because it gleaned them so much more money. One fellow, his father, was one of the earliest who they tried to drag into this movement, you know, especially the abortion uh, movement, the anti-abortion movement. And he said, you know, that he was in this movement from the very beginning, from the very onset of it. And he said, I watched and I have seen as these preachers have learned to manipulate the masses because they get so emotionally caught up in this issue that they become blind to everything else. You can rock them blind. This is why there's so many Americans today who support a political party that claims to be the only party that any Christian should be part of. And there are a bunch of idiots in America who are part of that party and who will tell you, you can't be a Christian and not be part of this party. And all the while, that party is raping the middle class and destroying the poor and literally just trying to turn our society into a... Uh, two-class society, those who are served and those who serve. And the entire working class is being reduced by that party into what amounts to slaves, working for wages that don't work. And yet, these people are so caught up in the emotion of the anti-abortion. They're so caught up in the anti-LGBT. They're so Transgender and the culture war issues that they're blind to everything else that this party engages in. The devil loves to send people off on red herrings. He loves to have you looking in one direction so that he can sneak in behind you and damage and destroy and kill all the while you don't see a thing because you're so focused over here. The modern day church, my friend, has devolved as Israel had devolved in the Lord's day. In the Lord's day, the religion of Israel, the religion of Judaism, was basically a religion without mercy. You had to follow all the rules. You had to do everything the way the rabbi said to do it. Or else you were lost. You were hopeless. 
You were cursed by God and you would experience nothing good. I tell you, there's a lot of lessons the church could learn from our older sister Israel. Many churches in our world today preach a false message of what I refer to as zero-sum salvation or zero-sum theology. You either get it all right all the time or convert it or not, you will miss the rapture and be relegated to the belly of hell with all those who have refused to heed the message of the gospel. But the good news I have for you today, believer, is this. That is a false message. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not a zero-sum, all-or-nothing message. Oh, hallelujah. In fact, it is a message born of the fact that zero-sum theology cannot be won by any man, any woman, any boy, or any girl. Zero-sum game cannot be won. You can't win that game. An all-or-nothing proposition. Heaven or hell, that's all there is. Glory to God. Black or white, that's all there is. Every misstep, every failing, every fault, every sin will put you back in the lost column. Below me. The law of Moses proved beyond a doubt that zero sum was an impossible standard to meet. The law of Moses was a zero sum game. The Word of God said to fail at one point of the law was to fail at them all. Right. That is zero sum, okay? The law was zero sum. And the law proved to us that it's an impossible standard. It cannot be met. For that reason, we need it, and we need today a Savior. We need one who can do for all humanity what no man, woman, boy, or girl is capable of doing for themselves. To accomplish this task, the God of all glory manifested himself to us as the man Jesus Christ, flesh and blood, so that he himself, God, Jehovah God, God the Father, might do for us what we could not possibly do for ourselves. In Romans 8, 1 through 4, the Word of God declares, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law that Jesus Christ has brought us under, listen to me children, has freed us from the zero sum theology of the Old Testament law. Hallelujah! Therefore, New Testament salvation is not a zero sum game. Verse 3, Romans 8. For what the law could not do, could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. 
that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. The problem is your Pentecostal preachers and your holiness theologians try to tell you that when you walk after the spirit that means that you walk perfectly that you walk sinlessly that you become this holy person on planet earth who walks around doing everything right saying everything right acting entirely right that is not even close to what the apostle paul was saying in romans chapter 8 no the, the Apostle Paul was saying in Romans chapter 8 that when we come to Christ, we come under a whole new set of laws. What are laws? Laws are immutable facts. They are realities. There's the laws of nature, for instance. You have the law of gravity. You can't change that. It is what it is, okay? When we come to Christ, we come under a whole new set of laws laws. There's a whole new set of realities that we live under, okay? Now the sinner that lives next door to us, the unbeliever who lives across the street from us, is not living under the same set of laws that you and I are living under. We are under an entirely different set of rules. The environment, the place where we live, so to speak, is governed by entirely different, immutable, unchangeable, forever established facts. Things work differently for the believer. And what the Apostle Paul is saying, the believer who understands this and therefore is walking in a spiritual mindset and walking with a spiritual mind is the individual who is walking after the Spirit. As a born again child of God, we no longer look upon or measure ourselves against the abilities of our flesh but rather by faith we embrace the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary and we wrap ourselves in his perfection so that we might appear righteous and holy in the eyes of our God God's response to our faith is grace. He doesn't tell us that in order to obtain grace, we must do this or we must do that. Because if he were to ask us to do something in order to secure grace, he would be obliterating and nullifying grace itself. The minute you ask somebody to do something in order to secure grace, it is no more grace. Mm -hmm. In Romans chapter uh, 11, verse 6, the Apostle Paul writes, And if by grace, then, it be, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So what is he saying? He's saying works and grace do not mix. You can't put the two of them together. The minute you try to put God demanding something of you in order to secure grace, then, my friend, you have obliterated grace. There is no more grace. That's not how grace works. And that shows you how so many in the church world today are not in the Spirit and are not walking after the Spirit because that is the very nature of the message they preach. That's right. The message of the gospel and the very plan of salvation itself are not meant to extract payment from 
the believer for grace, which is free, but rather it instructs us, listen to me carefully, children, uh, you know, I've been in the apostolic movement now for a long time, and it always makes me laugh how people try to characterize the Acts 2.38 message. And they say, oh, Acts 2.38, you're saying you've got to repent and be baptized in Jesus' name and receive the Holy Ghost. You've got to do these things in order to secure grace. You've got to do these things in order to earn God's grace. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, not even close. Listen, I'll explain it to you so you can better understand how this works. The plan of salvation is not meant to extract payment from the believer for grace, which is free, but it instructs us in the necessary steps, listen carefully, to make the physical work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary translate into a spiritual transaction which will stand the test of eternity. On the day of Pentecost, Peter got up and preached Jesus. He preached Jesus lived, Jesus was crucified, Jesus was buried three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. Hallelujah. And when he was all done with his message, those who had come to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Okay, you've preached the gospel, but now what is the plan of salvation? How do we apply what Jesus did to our lives? How there has to be some kind of a spiritual transaction that takes place. How do we go about conducting this spiritual transaction? How do we access God's grace? Not how do we earn it. Not how do we win it. No, 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 no. There's a difference. How do we access it? It's there. He's put it out there. He said, here it is. Now listen, I'm going to try to give you a an analogy that hopefully will help you to put this together in your mind. God does not say to us, you must go to a mountain and cut down a tree, offer an animal in sacrifice, and then return with the bones of that animal, and I will impart grace unto you. No, he'd be asking you to do things in order to uh, earn that grace. And you do these things and then I'll impart grace unto you. No, rather he says, my grace is available to you free of charge. But to obtain that grace, you must climb the steps onto my front porch, open the box that sits on the stoop, and remove the envelope containing the grapes. Now, if somebody says to you, if you're a paper boy, I used to deliver papers when I was a kid. When you're a paper boy and it comes time to collect, and you've got to go around to all your customers, you know, and you got to get your money for their paper uh, subscription, right? Uh, some of my Customers would say to me, of course, now I'm a lot older than many people who are probably watching. Years ago, we used to have milkmen that would come around to your house and deliver milk. And they would put the milk in these little uh, boxes on your porch, so just a small box. It was insulated, you know, so that they could put the cold milk in there and it would stay good in the heat of the sun until you got it out later in the day. And some of my customers would say to me, Charles, uh, when it comes time to collect your money, all you've got to do is come up on my porch and open up the milk box and I'll leave an envelope with the money in the milk box. Now by me going up on that porch and opening the milk box and removing the envelope, am I earning that money? 
No, I'm not. I'm accessing it. That's all I'm doing. I'm getting a hold of it. They've given me instructions of how to get the money. The money is there. I'm not having to. I'm not having to do this to earn it. I'm having to do this to access it. You follow what I'm saying? The message of Acts two thirty eight: Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. None of that is about earning God's grace. It's about accessing God's grace. God says, "Listen, my grace is there. My unmerited, unearned." undeserved favor is there for you but this is a spiritual thing this is not a natural thing it's not a donut it's not a bagel it's not a piece of bread that I can hand you physically salvation is not something I can physically hand you it is a spiritual thing and therefore somehow some way we have to take the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ and somehow in the natural physical world we have to apply it to ourselves and in so doing tap into this spiritual plane. Do you follow what I'm saying? Baptism is an ordinance that helps us to identify with the spiritual plane. Baptism, we identify with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. According to the Word of God, we are following Him in the waters of baptism. That's why He said to John when He went to the River Jordan to be baptized of John the Baptist. And John said, No, Lord. I can't baptize you. You should be baptizing me. And the Lord said, no, 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 John. You must do this. He said, this is necessary that all righteousness be fulfilled. What was he saying? He said, I'm the first. I am doing this so that every believer... Oh my God, I'm telling you, when, you, when you think about this, it's exciting. Every believer, everybody who believes this gospel is going to follow my example, glory to God, and they're going to go down in the waters of baptism in my name. And in so doing, they are going to identify with me, and they are going to apply. They're going to apply. They're going to apply my death, my burial, and my resurrection to their own life. They are going to secure a spiritual blessing through a natural act. Hallelujah. This act of baptism is what allows us to bridge the flesh, the human, the natural with the spirit, the divine salvation. Glory to God. So the salvation plan is not about earning salvation. It's simply about securing it. It's there, but it's in the spiritual plane. How do I get there? How do I get in that plane so that I can lay hold of this? In Romans 4, verses 1 through 8, the word of the Lord said, What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh, hath found. For if Abraham was justified by work, justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If you have to work in order to be saved in the end, then grace is nowhere to be found. You're trying to work off your debt. But to him that worketh not 
but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Folks, how hard is this to understand? His faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. says, whom the Lord will not impute sin. It doesn't mean that man doesn't have sin, but it means his sin will not be held against him. Oh, hallelujah. And what's the difference between the man whose sin will not be held against him and the man whose sin will be held against him? Faith in the work of Jesus Christ. The salvation plan has nothing to do with earning salvation, which is provided through grace. But rather, it is simply the means by which we access that grace, as it requires the spiritual transaction, which then applies the actions of one man some 2,000 years ago to our own lives today. So when we obey the message of Acts 2.38 as a means of laying hold on of that which the Lord has made freely available to us, we do so not as a means of payment for the grace, but rather as a means of accessing that which has been freely offered. Romans 6 and 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Galatians 3.27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 21. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened or made alive again by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the Spirit's in prison, meaning he descended into hell during his three days dead and preached to those who had died anticipating and waiting for the Messiah, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now listen, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not a physical transaction. It's a physical act but it taps into a spiritual transaction. It's not about becoming clean physically, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto Him. If I tell my paper boy that he's got to climb the three steps on the front of my house, lift the lid on the milk box, 
beside my front door and remove the envelope from inside the box so that he can get his payment. I'm not asking him to work for the payment, but I'm letting him know where his payment may be found if I tell the truth. Yeah. How does God, who is a spirit, invisible to the human eye, how does he impart salvation to a believing sinner? In James chapter 2, the, the Lord's brother said, faith without works is dead. Faith without action is dead. In order to activate faith, we must act upon that faith. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ said at the end of the Gospel of Mark, uh, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Why? Because baptism, the act of baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins is an act of faith. You are acting upon your faith. In so doing, you're activating your faith. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Amen. So how does God, who is the Spirit, He's invisible, how in the world does he impart salvation to a believing sinner? It's as easy as one, two, three. He asks simply that we turn from sin and unbelief and we turn to faith and to desire to do right. He then says, demonstrate your professed faith by following my example and joining me in the waters of baptism. Where my name, my saving name, the only name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved, will be called over you. Glory to God and the authority and the glory of that name will cause your past sins to be forever buried. And you will arise to a new life in Christ, symbolically and spiritually, listen, wrapped in His glory and His holiness, hallelujah, in His righteousness and in His perfection. Know ye not, then as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. I read that to you a moment ago. Romans 6 and 3. And then again, Galatians 3, 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Hallelujah. Do you see how this physical act <laughs> is the spiritual transaction. Oh my word. It's how you make your faith work. It's how it makes, it activates faith and allows our faith to work. Lastly, he instructs us to receive his spirit whereby he promises to breathe life back into our spiritual man even as God first breathed life into the nostrils of the first Adam. So that like Adam, oh my word, we might exist as a living soul which will never know death and live in God's presence for eternity without end. Hallelujah. Oh, my friend, we don't earn salvation through obedience to the salvation plan of Acts 2.38, but rather we simply access that salvation which has been freely provided. It's not about jumping through hoops to get to the prize that is promised, but rather it is instructions for the carnal man so that he might lay hold of that which is spiritual and not carnal. In 1 John 2, 1 and 2, John writes, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. For if any man sin, he goes to hell immediately. He is lost. He's backslidden. 
Oh, wait a minute. It doesn't say that. My goodness. Let me see. I, I got to take off my United Pentecostal Church glasses and put on my spiritual glasses. He will miss the rapture and have to go through the great. Oh, I'm going to take off my Assemblies of God glasses and put on my spiritual glasses. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ the righteous. Glory to God. And he is the propitiation for our sins. Meaning he is the satisfaction for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Oh my Lord, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of stuff, the way the King James, the way a lot of translators interpret things I've told you before, is based on doctrinal bias. Okay? In truth, John is saying this, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. We have something that's pleads our case before the Father. But the way it's worded in the King James is Jesus Christ the righteous, which implies that this second person, this other person, pleads our case. No, 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 no. If you go into the Greek and you look at this, what you'll find is, oh my God, Oh my God, this is beautiful. What, what you'll find is, this should read, we have an advocate with the Father, we have something that pleads our case with the Father, the righteousness ooh, hmm, of Jesus Christ. <laughs> as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. He, uh, 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 oh my God. And honey, when you're wearing Christ, if you do sin, His righteousness, oh my God, have mercy, cries out to God for mercy. <laughs> His righteousness intercedes on our behalf. Why? Because God doesn't see our sin. He sees the righteousness of Christ. Oh my God. Hallelujah. Tell me for an LGBT affirming church. We will have some good preaching going on in this place. Amen. I get so sick and tired of people don't appreciate what God has put in the midst of this community. My God have mercy. My God have mercy. Jesus. My soul gets so grieved sometimes I want to spit my teeth out of my head. If I had had a church like this available to me when I first came out in 1989, do you have any god-awful clue in the universe how much pain and struggle and suffering and garbage I could have avoided in my life? Mm -hmm. I didn't have a church like this available to me. But there's been a church like this available to people in Dallas, Texas. There's been a church like this available to people in New York City. There's been a church like this available to people in Atlanta, Georgia. There's been a church like this available to people in New Haven, Connecticut for the past 30 years. And most of these fools have ignored it and passed it by. And honey, I'm going to tell you something. You're not going to like what I have to say. But hell's fire is going to burn hot for people who walk past, ignore, and avoid something that God has gone to tremendous efforts to make available to you when there is very few, very few, very few, very few who would even make the effort to try. I'm up here preaching and this message is touching me till I'm about ready to sprout wings and fly. My God, what I wouldn't have done for a church that preached this message when I was young, growing up in the Pentecostal church. 
First Timothy 2, 5 and 6, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Many want you to believe, especially according to Trinitarian doctrine, that this passage is saying that Jesus Christ exists even today as a mediator between God and man. The only problem with that is, if that were true, then that would mean that Calvary did not cover it all. That the Lord still has to mediate, or He still has to negotiate with God for our salvation. Do you follow what I'm telling you? But that's not scriptural. No, the mediator has already mediated. He is the propitiation, meaning he satisfied the terms of the agreement between God and humanity. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. In Hebrews 8 and 6, the word of the Lord declares, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, listen, which was established upon better promises. So the other covenant, the new covenant, has already been established. So no, Jesus Christ does not yet mediate. He has mediated. Do you follow what I'm telling you? But there's only one mediator between God and man. There's only one who is qualified and capable of mediating a new contract, a new covenant between God and humanity. Who was that? Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews 9.15 And for this cause, He is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions, that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So this is the terms of the new covenant, the new contract that he has mediated. Like the blood of Abel in the book of Genesis, which cried out to God from the ground upon which it fell, the righteous blood of the Lamb of God cries out day and night on behalf of those who have placed their faith in its sufficiency. Hallelujah. God told Cain, said, your brother's blood cries out to me, didn't he? Oh, I'm going to tell you, there's a reason why. Everything God does, everything God says in the Word of the Lord, there is a reason for every word you read. Because, honey, when the blood of Jesus Christ spilled out on the cross of Calvary, oh, I want to tell you, throughout the entirety of the existence of, that, of this world, that blood will cry out for mercy. That blood will cry out for grace. That blood will intercede for us. Oh, hallelujah to God. It doesn't mean he didn't say that your brother cries out to me. No, he said your blood, the, your brother's blood cries out. I want to tell you today, the blood of Jesus Christ. If we sin, if we sin, glory to God, it is not a zero-sum game. We have an advocate with the Father, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. We are never alone in our journey. Our salvation is not at all easily lost. We cannot slip away from the grace of God, but rather we must walk away from God's grace. And we must renounce it in order to be in such a place as to not ever allow us second access to that grace which brought us salvation to begin with. In Hebrews 6, 1-6, the Apostle Paul writes, 
Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, meaning maturity or completion, not laying again the foundation. Now listen to what Paul claims is the foundation of our faith and the doctrine of Christ, the principles of the doctrine of Christ. He said, not laying again the foundation of, and now he lists what amounts to the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, plural, water, spirit, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. So Paul said, it is impossible for anybody that God has opened their eyes so that they might see and understand this gospel. Anybody who has as well received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Listen to this. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, now this doesn't mean if they slip and fall, if they sin, if they, you know, if they act wrong or do the wrong thing, no, no, no. If they leave the faith, if they literally walk away from faith in Jesus Christ and they renounce or deny this great gospel message. He said, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. Listen, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. You remember what I said about the, the salvation plan? It's about accessing the grace of God. Not about, it's not about earning. It's about accessing. It's a transaction whereby we access the grace of God. Paul says, if you have done what you needed to do to access that grace, and then you turn around and you walk away, from this message and you turn your back on this message and you renounce this message he said folks there is no way for you to come back he said there's no way for you to come back why well it's easy because you can't crucify Jesus a second time you've already done everything that's necessary to access that grace to begin with now if you put yourself if you walk away and you deny it and you renounce it he said now at that point you have literally cut yourself off because you've already conducted the transaction now you've nullified that transaction but you can't crucify Christ yet again well, can I just be baptized in Jesus' name again and identify with his death, burial, and resurrection a second time? No, because you don't understand. When you're baptized in the name of the Lord, you are going down with him. According to the word of God, you are baptized into his death. Literally, it is a physical act with a spiritual uh, transaction involved, right? So therefore, how can you go down again? The Lord didn't die twice, nor will He die twice. That's how real that transaction is. Oh my goodness. He said, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. But now listen to Hebrews 3, 12 through 15. I'm almost done today. Take 
heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you, listen, any sin, nope, any failure, nope, any fault, nope, any conduct that is displeasing to God, nope, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Remember what I said? You can't slip away from grace. You have to walk away from grace. He said, be careful that the, you don't be overcome by an evil heart of unbelief. And you walk away. You depart from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ. If. Biggest word in the Bible is if. We hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. That as long as you keep your faith in Christ steady all the way to the end he said then all will be well we are made partakers of Christ if we hold this faith and we don't let it go hallelujah he didn't say if we walk holy and perfect if we do not sin if we do not fail that's not what he said he said if we hold fast to our confidence my God have mercy steadfast unto the end while it is said today if ye will hear his voice harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ my friend is not a zero sum message that was the message of the Old Testament law but understanding that humanity is incapable of physical perfection in this life God created a plan which employs grace. That plan provides for our weaknesses, our faults, and our sins. It covers our failings so long as we continue to walk after the spiritual principles of faith and obedience. God is calling us today to rise above the message of hopelessness and fear and embrace the truth that is found in the good news of Christ's gospel. Our doctrine today is a doctrine of grace and not a message of zero-sum theology. And I close with this, Romans chapter 10, 1 through 13. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? 
that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. This is not the salvation plan. This is how believers stay in grace. The Baptists will tell you this is how you get saved. They're lying to you. Acts 2.38 is how you get saved. Acts 2.38 is the spiritual transaction that accesses God's grace, honey. But once you've obeyed the gospel and you've accessed that grace, you will stay in that grace till the day you die. How? If thou shalt believe in thine heart, the Lord Jesus, uh, uh, excuse me, let me, <laughs> let me read it to you. My mind's tired today. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Listen. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. you believe this gospel with all of your heart? Yes, I do. Then, honey, I got news for you. Fault or no fault, sin or no sin, weakness or no weakness, God sees you as righteous. Oh, hallelujah. Why? Because when you were baptized in Jesus' name, you put on Christ. Hallelujah. And all God sees is the righteousness of Christ. Oh, glory to God. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Oh, LGBT believer, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Oh, glory to God. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. Our gospel today is a message of grace. It is not zero-sum theology. Hallelujah. Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Praise the Lord.